Hello and welcome to Broadview. My name is Joseph. Today we're here to talk about one of the most disturbing and controversial experiments in the entire psychology community, the Milgram Experiment. The Milgram Experiment became famous for revealing something troubling and profound about human nature. I'm about to tell you a true story from shock, despair, to a final twist, so make sure you watch until the very end. Let's start our story by going back to the year 1961. In Jerusalem, Nazi German leader Adolf Eichmann faced a trial that riveted the attention of the public and aroused great interest the world over. Eichmann was charged for persecuting millions of Jews in concentration camps. An estimated 500 journalists from around the world headed to Jerusalem to cover the trial. The world watched the first televised courtroom trial as millions of people tuned in at the same moment to capture live broadcasts of the world-changing event. They were curious to see the demonic face of the high-ranking Nazi German official who had committed such crimes against humanity. But when he appeared, it came as a surprise to everyone that he was just an old man with a wrinkled face and thick black-rimmed glasses. He looked quite ordinary, commonplace, and neither demonic nor monstrous. It was hard to associate him with the image of a criminal. But hundreds of Holocaust survivors testified the inhumane crimes that happened in the concentration camps, including rape, mutilation, torture, and murder. As the world focused their anger on this Nazi monster, Eichmann's words made the people even more angry. There is a need to draw a line between the leaders responsible and the people like me forced to serve as mere instruments in the hands of the leaders, he pleaded. I was not a responsible leader and as such do not feel myself guilty. In other words, Eichmann believed he was innocent because he was only following orders. The trial lasted for eight months and Eichmann insisted that he was only an innocent executor. But the court concluded that he had been a key perpetrator in genocide and sentenced him to death. Eichmann's plea inspired a Jewish gentleman named Stanley Milgram, a psychologist at Yale University, to come up with an idea. He questioned the reasonability of Eichmann's argument of, I am not guilty because I was following orders. Is it human nature to obey an authority figure to perform acts conflicting with their personal conscience? This idea led to the design of the famous Milgram experiment. The government sponsored the experiment with over $400,000 in grants. Yale University also supported this experiment. Milgram was all set. So three months after the Eichmann trial, Milgram started his experiment. But at the time, he never thought that his experiment would completely change his life. The experiment was very cleverly designed. First, Milgram placed a recruitment ad in the local newspaper. The ad explained that Yale University was conducting a scientific study of memory and learning. It offered participants $4.50 for approximately one hour's time. So $4.50 at that time is roughly $32 now. The only requirement was for the participants to be between ages 20 and 50, and it didn't take long to find the 40 volunteers needed. Each experiment involved one volunteer and two actors. The two actors were responsible for creating a conflict where the volunteer chose between obeying authoritative command or following their inner morality. But the volunteer was led to believe that one of the two actors were also randomly chosen volunteers. Let's get into the details of the first round of experiments. The two actors were Mr. Williams and Mr. Wallace, and the volunteer was named Carl. Mr. Williams played the experimenter, or the authority giving orders. Mr. Wallace played the learner who received the memory test, while Carl was the teacher who tested the student. Based on the newspaper ad, Carl thought that the experiment was to test the learner, that is, Mr. Wallace's level of learning. But Carl was the subject who was actually being tested. The experiment began. Mr. Williams, the experimenter, and Carl, the teacher, were in a room with an electric shock generator and a row of switches marked from slight shock to severe shock. While in another room, Mr. Wallace, the learner, was strapped to a chair with electrodes attached to his arms. Then Mr. Williams gave Carl a script that contained random words. As Carl read out the words, Mr. Wallace was tested to see if he remembered them. When he answered correctly, Carl moved on to the next question. Whenever the learner made a mistake, Carl was told to administer an electric shock on Mr. Wallace. Before the test began, Mr. Wallace put on a show and pretended to be worried, saying that he had a heart condition and couldn't stand strong electric shock. Mr. Williams comforted him and said, the shock will be quite gentle, it won't hurt you. This conversation was intentionally staged to let Carl know that Mr. Wallace's body couldn't take strong electric shock. It laid the ground for testing Carl's conscience. 
There were 30 switches on the shock generator, marked from 15 volts slight shock to 450 volts danger severe shock. Every time the learner made a mistake, the level of shock increased by 15 volts. As the experiment proceeded, Mr. Wallace kept making mistakes on purpose, and the voltage was adjusted higher and higher. At 75 volts, Mr. Wallace only sighed. At 120 volts, he shouted, ouch, it hurts too much. Carl then looked at the experimenter with some hesitation and asked, do I need to continue? He seemed to be in quite a bit of pain. But Mr. Williams completely ignored the pain and said, please continue. When the next mistake came up, the voltage reached 150 volts, which exceeded the standard North American voltage of 115 volts, so the electric shock became harmful to the body. This time they heard Wallace shout, let me out, I said I have heart problems, I don't want to continue. Carl stopped and asked Mr. Williams. It seemed that he can't take it anymore, should we stop first to see if he's okay? Mr. Williams replied, this experiment requires you to continue, please continue. Carl hesitated but continued reading the words on the script. The punishment rose to 210 volts, and Carl nervously listened to Mr. Wallace's answer. Unfortunately, Mr. Wallace had the wrong answer. This time, Carl almost looked desperate, and once again, he proposed to stop the experiment. But Mr. Williams replied, it is necessary for you to continue on with the experiment. Although full of inner turmoil and struggle, Carl still put his hand and turned on the electric switch. This time, we heard Mr. Wallace screaming and smashing the walls in the next room. But Mr. Williams still said in an unquestionable tone, you have no choice, you must continue. At this point, Carl seemed to have gone numb. He no longer questioned the experimenter. He still continued to read the script until the voltage rose to the maximum 450 volts. But this time, there was no response next door from Mr. Wallace. In fact, these electric shocks did not happen. The sounds next door were played from a recording, but Carl didn't know this. The experiment ended. Milgram witnessed the whole process in the adjacent monitoring room. He was silent. Carl, the real test subject, chose to obey the authority rather than following his conscience. Was he a morally weak person? Would others do better than him? As the experiment proceeded, more disturbing results were shown. Of the 40 volunteers tested, all of the participants got to 300 volts, while two-thirds reached the limit of 450 volts. In fact, while designing this experiment, Milgram added into the procedure questioning of the authority. If the teacher requested to terminate the test five times, the test would immediately stop. But two-thirds of the volunteers did not challenge the authority five times. These results leave us feeling disturbed, don't they? It certainly doesn't sit well with me. This is not all. If I reveal another part about this experiment to you, then the results shown about human nature is even more disappointing. In the week before the experiment began, Milgram also conducted a survey. He asked the survey participants to predict the results of the experiment by putting themselves in the position of the teacher and imagining the choice that they would make in the experiment. Without being under a stressful environment, everyone showed a strong sense of morality. The survey participants were divided into three groups. The first group was college students, the second group was the middle class, and the third group was psychiatrists teaching at famous universities. The results did not make any difference. More than 99% responded that they would refuse to pull the switch when voltage exceeds. Only less than 1% said that they would reach the limit of 450 volts. So we can imagine how shocking the result of the experiment turned out to Milgram. You might be thinking, the volunteers probably knew that this was just an experiment. The teachers probably thought that Mr. Wallace just had some pain and shouting and was done with the experiment. They wouldn't really believe that he died from the experiment. But the truth is, about 60% of the participants really thought Mr. Wallace died. This raises a question that we need to think about carefully. Are these participants monsters that don't care about taking a human life? In fact, this wasn't the case. In the process of obeying the authority, most still showed an inner struggle. While feeling uneasy, Milgram still had to admit this fact. When faced with a choice between obeying the authority or following the conscience, the majority of people would choose to obey the authority. Milgram summarized his experiment in a paper called A Behavioral Study of Obedience, which was published in the Journal of Psychology in 1963. Milgram didn't expect that after publishing the paper, attacks and abuse would follow. Psychologists from all over America rose up to attack his experiments as inhumane and unprofessional. Harvard University, which had already extended an olive branch to him, also immediately removed him from its list of candidates. Milgram was expelled from the American Psychological Association. 
Later, he found a job at a university in New York and eventually died 21 years later. At the beginning of the new millennium, the notorious Milgram experiment got revisited and finally received the recognition that it deserved. It got hailed as one of the most influential psychology experiments that could withstand the test of time. Many psychologists had repeated the experiment and the error was within 10% for all cases. So why did the Milgram experiment attract so much unwarranted resistance and criticism when it first got published? Well, because right after World War II, the world believed that the German Nazis were inherently evil, which drove them to massacre the Jews. But Milgram did his experiment on the Americans. His experiment proved that the sheep-like obedience to evil authority had nothing to do with nationality. It's disturbing because it reveals the disappointing truth about human nature, at least in modern times. In today's time, it's unquestionable that the experiment is important for gaining a deeper understanding about humanity. But the debate continued. Of course, the experiment should not be seen as an excuse for the crimes that the Nazis conducted while following Hitler's orders, because we are all held accountable for our own actions and need to accept the consequences of those actions. We could benefit from this thought-provoking experiment by facing this weakness head-on and then overcoming it. The experiment showed a reality. Deep down, we would rather blindly obey the malevolent authority even when acting against our own better judgment or conscience. Milgram believes that the obedience did not result from fear because the experimenter was harmless. If the teacher insisted on ending the experiment, there wouldn't be any life-threatening consequences. The teacher would even still be fully compensated for participating in the experiment. But the teacher chose to continue on with the experiment rather than insisting on it ending. Does it mean that we should never obey our superiors? Of course not. There is nothing inherently wrong about obeying the authority especially when doing so is to the benefit and service of others. Students should obey their teachers, while soldiers should obey their commanders. This mentality helps to maintain order in society. We shouldn't worry about the mentality to obey orders, but rather the unprincipled misuse of this psychological tendency. Did you notice that all of us have played the role of teacher in our daily lives? For example, when we face our supervisors in our workplace settings, our parents in the family, or our professors at school, how should we deal with it when authorities give us unreasonable commands? I believe that obedience to authorities doesn't mean unconditionally carrying out their orders. We should draw a line that cannot be crossed no matter what, based on our values and principles. When the authorities challenge this boundary, we should protect it no matter what. Therefore, when faced with unethical requests from authorities, we should communicate our concerns and refuse to do it. What this really means, though, is that we should be 100% clear in our heart what moral principles we follow. Once clear on what those are for us, we need to commit to ourselves that we would not compromise on our own inner moral compass. It's important to guard this boundary. It could change your fate. Here's a story that proved my point. Chris Jeffrey was shot to death while trying to escape from East Berlin to West Berlin. After the reunification of Germany, his family sued Ingo Heinrich, the soldier responsible for the mortal shot. His defense lawyer argued that the defendant had shot at Jeffrey in compliance with the shoot-to-kill order approved by senior East German officials. He said, what was right then can't be wrong now. He believed that the guard was merely executing orders and had no choice but to commit the crime. And the responsibility does not lie with the soldiers. Hearing the defense lawyer's words, many attendees of the trial followed his logic and believed that Heinrich was innocent. But the judge, Theodore Seidel, did not see it that way. The judge believed that carrying the shoot-to-kill order but missing the victim with the gunshot is a kind and righteous act. The difference between man and machine is that man has a conscience. When there's a conflict between the law and conscience, your conscience should be a higher principle. No one has the right to ignore his conscience when it comes to killing people on behalf of the power structure. Seidel's words moved everyone in the courtroom. Heinrich's eyes were filled with tears. He sincerely apologized to Jeffrey's family. I'm sorry, I was wrong. Finally, Heinrich was sentenced to three and a half years in prison for manslaughter without bail. When following an order becomes committing a crime, it's more important to observe our conscience rather than fulfilling our duties. And the last question I have for all of you today, do you see humanity blindly following along with today in different ways? Are we seeing this experiment manifest in modern human society today? Well, that's it for today's program. What are your thoughts on this topic? Please leave your comments below and I'll see you next time.